Hi, everyone. I am Kirstra. We are back with another book break for you. Um, so, again, I'm Kirstra. I am one of the librarians here. <laughs> I uh, moderate the Pints and Prose book discussion group, as well as the virtual science fiction and fantasy book discussion group. And as always, I am here with Claire. Hi, I'm Claire. Um, I order the teen fiction and I also moderate two book discussions groups, the historical fiction online on Facebook and as the page turns, which we are doing through Zoom right now. So. And today we have a special guest, Miss Cheryl. Do you want Hi, to everybody. introduce yourself? I'm Miss Cheryl and I'm one of the, the children's librarians here and I do story times um, right now. There's story times every Tuesday on Facebook and YouTube and sleepy time story time Wednesday evenings and then sensory sensitive story time and then Saturday stories. So we're doing lots on online. Awesome. And today Ms. Cheryl is actually going to discuss some adult books with us because in addition to story times, she actually reads um, pretty voraciously. I, I'm not saying, oh, Cheryl reads. I'm saying you read a lot. So how many, how many books did you read, Cheryl, while we were? During quarantine? Um, yeah. Um, 20, 21. Yeah. Wow. Well, I don't have kids at home, so. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so Cheryl, do you want to start with one of the books that sure. you read that you enjoyed? Sure. One of the ones that I read, I, I like historical fiction a lot. Um, not a huge fan of the royals, but I do like royal history and have been very interested in The Crown and um, Victoria and, and those shows. So one of the books I wanted to read was called The Gown, and it's by Jennifer Robson. And it is about the making of Princess Elizabeth's wedding gown uh, after World War II and about uh, how it was embroidered. It's really, really gorgeous. And it kind of combines real events with some made up characters. Um, so it was about basically two embroiderers, um, Anna and Anne and Miriam. And Miriam is a real person. Miriam Dassin is a, a, a textile artist and her, her embroidery works are, are in museums. And they worked at the house of Hartnell, which was the house that was given the um, privilege to make the princess's wedding gown. And since it was in a time of um, rationing, uh, it, there was some criticism because it was quite elaborate. And then there were other people who were sending the ration coupons to make uh, the princess's wedding gown as gorgeous as it could be. So it has to do with those two um, characters and how they formed a friendship. And that was in 1947. And then it also goes to 2016 with a character, Heather, and she ends up, she is the granddaughter of Anne, and she found some embroidery in her grandmother's, um, not, not her remains, that sounds terrible. <laughs> her effects. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in her effects. And so she, uh, she's also a journalist, of course. And so she um, takes on the task of finding out the history of this embroidery and then finds out about um, Miriam and, uh, of course, ends up in love with Miriam's great-grandson. And, you know, there's a great love story in there as well. But um, it was quite fascinating in how uh, the time period and everything that went into the gown and making it. And it was quite interesting to me that since there was no paparazzi at the time, the lengths they went to to keep it secret. Um, everyone basically swore on their life and every, the building was completely sealed. And it was just so completely different from today where there are no secrets anywhere. So that was interesting about it as well. That's it. That sounds fascinating. It was. It was. Yeah, I, I read that one too, it. Cheryl, and it was really good. And that's, um, I think there was a guy that started dating one of those seamstresses who was really trying to get the yes. detail. So 
So people went to any lengths to find yes. out what that gown looked like. Yes, they certainly oh. did. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Crazy. Yep. Well, can I go next? Because I'm oh. kind of in the same time period and Great Britain. And um, Sure. I read Lady Clementine by Marie Benedict. And if you're not familiar with Marie Benedict, she tends to write historical fiction about women who are very important to history, but have kind of been overlooked in the shuffle. Um, I really enjoyed her books. Uh, I read um, The Other Einstein, which was about Einstein's mm -hmm. wife. And I really uh, liked this one. And it really made me very curious about what the real Clementine um, Churchill was really like. So this one is about the story of how Clementine and Winston met up until like the end of their lives. And um, Clementine would certainly not get a mother of the year award. <laughs> then again, raising children in Great Britain during that time period, especially if you were wealthy, is totally different than the model of what we have today. Mm -hmm. but, um, but even so, she, she really took some liberties. <laughs> but. Um, she did, though, serve Winston in every capacity and was so dedicated to him and his career and really gave him a lot of good insight into how to better relate to people. And, um, mm -hmm. and I, I admired her because she really took on the cause of the British people um, during the bombing of great you know, London. She was a fire watcher. And when she first received her shift, they thought she was really there for publicity's sake and whatever. When she saw some bombing, it was like, excuse me, I have a call to make. And, you know, she really stuck with her duty. And also she would um, go with Winston to the bomb shelters and she was just appalled at what people had for bomb shelters, um, like no sanitation. They were there for 12 or 14 hours at a time. So she really tried to um, do that as a cause and better that for the people. And doing all of these different things, she really endured her, you know, the people began to love her and then it transferred over to him. Um, she also told off Charles, Charles de Gaulle from France when he made a negative comment about um, the British people. Um, and then he ended up sending her flowers and apologizing. So very strong woman. Um, we are also going to be reading this book for our historical fiction Facebook book club, which we'll be discussing at next Tuesday night at seven o'clock right on Facebook. So it is available on Hoopla as an ebook. So you still have time to read. You know, I, I actually went through it pretty quickly. I had the book book, but um, it is available on Hoopla. So the gown was on Hoopla as well. Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. And we'll have. Um, Hoopla links in the comments. If you didn't see those, um, you can always just click right on those links to get to those specific books in Hoopla. Um, so my first book, so I didn't get the um, sort of Royals, the Crown, uh, British Empire memo. Um, so both of my books are um, about Hawaii. Um, I figured since we are suddenly living in the tropics here, um, I thought it would be appropriate. Um, so my first book is um, Sharks in the Time of Saviors by Kawhi Strong Washburn. Um, this was a really interesting book and I'm still kind of trying to sort through how I feel about it. Um, I think it was a really interesting book and I definitely think that it's worth reading. I'm not sure I liked it, um, but it's it's a magical realism um, set in Hawaii. The main character, well, there. so it's all about a family. Um, the Flores family in Hawaii, they are um, native Hawaiians, they're Filipino Hawaiian. Um, so there's, the parents are Malia and Augie, and the kids are Dean, Nainoa, and Kaui. And sort of the, the event that kicks off the book is, um, Malia and Augie, so the parents, um, are out one night and they see um, what we are to assume is kind of a vision 
of um, sort of ancestral Hawaiians. They call them the night marchers. So they're marching through this valley with torches. And it's just kind of this, you know, sort of mystical event in their lives. And that's the night that Nainoa, the middle child, is conceived. Um, so he starts with this sort of um, magical, mystical force behind his conception. And then when he's about seven years old, he falls off of a boat um, and is rescued by sharks. So a shark finds him and grabs him in his mouth and instead of eating him, delivers him back to the boat where his family is. Um, and then after that, you know, there's, there's more sort of um, unearthly things that happen and we get the sense that Nainoa is very special in some way. Um, and his parents think that he's very special. Of course, the other two children, so Dean and Cowie, um, are maybe not as special in their parents' eyes and feel sort of slighted in that Nainoa is getting all of this attention and support and they sort of feel like, eh, <laughs> they're over here, they're doing their own thing. So it follows, the book follows them um, through their like, teen years into early adulthood. Um, all three of the kids make their way to the mainland um, under different circumstances. Um, there's a lot of really sad parts of the book. I've been reading a lot of books that are <laughs> really sad lately and I need to get off that kick, I think. Um, but really sort of the central themes are connection and family. So there's this connection that everyone in the family feels to Hawaii and sort of the like ancestral mystical nature of Hawaii and where they're from and those sort of deep roots and that affects all of them differently. Um, and then there's the connections between them all to you know the other members of their family um, and to the families that they make for themselves. Um, so again, it's. It's really interesting. It's very well written. Um, again, not 100% sure I necessarily enjoyed it, but I think it would also be a really good book for discussion. Um, but there's tons of Hawaiian culture in there. Um, and it, uh, yeah, so it was another sort of atmospheric book. Like it really gives you a sense of the place of Hawaii, which I thought was really interesting because I've never been there. Mm -hmm. so. Now, I do have to say, <laughs> since I'm a children's person, mm -hmm. all I could think of while you were talking, Kirster, is baby shark. <laughs> 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 I'm Empty. sorry, my mind no, just goes yeah. there. So, yeah, absolutely. Ancestral <laughs> or not, baby shark is what came out. So Nice. Sounds baby shark book. There you go. And see, <laughs> I don't have any of my books with me because they're all checked out, yeah, so I couldn't like, okay. show them. Sorry. Okay, my turn? Mm -hmm. All right. So I am a actual book person. I'm not actually too much of an ebook person. So when we started this whole quarantine thing, I had a stack of like 12 books on my bedside table and of course blew through those in record time <laughs> and then was left with the dilemma, hmm, what now? So I actually downloaded Hoopla and looked around and I thought, yeah, I'm just not going to get into this. And I actually really did. And this next book was one of the bonus, what bonus, you call them? bonus, mm -hmm. bonus borrows where it didn't count against your five that you can check out a month. And I thought, well, let's give it a try because clearly I'm going to need more than five books this month. So um, it was called The Daughter-in-Law by Nina Manning. And, uh, you know, I like historical fiction, but I also like mystery, suspense, family stuff, you know, that kind of thing. So this one was about, spoiler alert, a daughter-in-law and a mother-in-law. And um, it was really interesting. Uh, I didn't think I'd like it. And I started reading it and it was one of those, okay, just one more chapter, <laughs> just one more chapter. And then she made you like, go oh, one more chapter. And so I read it pretty quickly. Um, it was about Annie, 
who's a single mom to her son, Ben. And Annie and Ben are very close. Like, you know, she doesn't want Ben to have anybody else in his life except for her. Um, she homeschooled him. She kind of didn't let him have friends. They just were like this. So imagine her dismay when Ben becomes a musician and then starts playing music and comes home to see her one day with a wife who is pregnant and her name is Daisy. So now we have Annie, Ben, and Daisy. And to say that Annie's not real thrilled with Daisy is um, probably an understatement. Um, you know, here comes another woman who's taken her son's attention away from her. And so it completely changes the mother-son dynamic. Um, so anyway, Ben ends up going missing. And Daisy and Annie end up in the same house together because Annie's pregnant and they're waiting for Ben to suddenly show up. And so it just goes from there and the daughter-in-law, mother-in-law relationship just goes. <laughs> and, and they are wondering where Ben is and it's this big mystery and I'm not gonna say anything else because that's part of what makes you wanna read to the end to find out what happens. But it was mostly about uh, the relationship, the mother-son relationship, um, which I can speak to that is a close relationship. And you know, when somebody else comes in, it does change the dynamic, but it's supposed to be that way. So most of us don't completely freak out and you know, have breakdowns about it, but Annie has a few problems. So anyway, it is quite the page turner and I would recommend it. And it's in a bonus borrow, so it doesn't count against your five checkouts. Nice. So, there you go. Yeah, awesome. I'm actually, I'm really excited that you liked the book. Um, the Daughter-in-Law is the Pints and Prose book for, I believe, July this year. Awesome. Um, so it is available in audio and ebook on Hoopla. Um, and we'll be discussing it on Zoom in the second week of July. Um, so I don't think it's up now to register for that, but keep an eye on our online events calendar. If you read the book and you want to join the discussion, you're certainly welcome to do that. So it sounds like we'll have um, a mm -hmm. lot to discuss. You'll like it. Just don't be an Annie. Okay. There Just you go. For all you people <laughs> out there, no Annie. Okay. <laughs> All right, my next one everyone remembers, or maybe you don't, that I joined Book of the Month Club out of desperation, <laughs> like Cheryl, because I like book books. And um, Sue Monk Kidd wrote a new one called The Book of Longing. And I loved her first one, which was The Secret Life of Bees. Hated the second one, which was The Mermaid Chair. Mm -hmm. um, and this one, the premise was so unusual that I, I just was intrigued and it's not a time period that I read about frequently. And for those of you that don't know, this is a not so religious imagining of Jesus's life that tackles the question, what if he had a wife and his wife was a feminist? So um, it would be That's a great discussion. It, it, it is interesting and it would be a great discussion choice. And what I really liked about it is I just gravitated toward these characters right away because she made them feel so real to me. And she kept what I would have thought would have been Jesus's personality of his kindness and just the person of who he was through the book. But I have to just, you know, it's a, a spoiler alert. She doesn't really go the religious route. Like you don't hear about miracles and, um, the ending kind of bothered me a bit, but anyway, but the, the, the way you could imagine his day-to-day -day living and his family and the way the families lived together at that time, um, I just couldn't stop reading it. You know, hmm. normally I think of a page turner as being a, a mystery or a thriller, hmm. but this one, I just really wanted to, even though I know what had happened, I, I had to find out what happened. Um, and his wife was just, um, 
she just fascinated me from the get-go because she she was just very different for her time. Um, I shouldn't really apply the term feminist, but she she wanted to write. That's what she hmm. really felt that God wanted her to do. And she had her own. Um, they were a Jewish family. She was kind of deeply religious. She took it all very seriously, but she didn't understand why there was this chasm in between what women were allowed to do in the faith and what men would be allowed to do when she felt she had these feelings, um, you know, about God and writing. So enter into the picture. Also, she's from a wealthy family. Her father's sister, who has kind of been bounced around from place to place, comes to stay with them, and she gives her this prayer bowl. And, um, you know, she writes in it, and she writes what her prayer is, and she kind of gives her encouragement for her writing, and her father does as well. He indulges her with papyrus and, you know, lets her write and kind of lets her be educated, which is something that was not common at the time, even for a wealthy woman. Um, they also have an adopted son in the family that is Judas Iscariot. Well, um, and you kind of see the path he chose in a very different light because his original family was killed by the Romans. Um, he is adopted by this prominent Jewish family, but he still has this dream of equality, which turns down into a zealot role mm -hmm. um, of vengeance and whatever. So you kind of understand the decisions he made, but yet he also does a lot of really kind things for Anna. Um, of course, you know, being a woman, she's betrothed to a very wealthy older man who would help her father's position. Um, oh, and her father's boss is um, Herod. So you find all of these characters that are in the Bible, and they become real to you in this story. And although I would have liked the ending to be a little bit different and to feature more of what I know as Christianity, I still could not stop reading this book, and I think it would make a great discussion book. So, and, and Suma Kid did do a lot of historical research as to what the family life would have been at that time, you know, how they would have lived. Um, just the different customs and everything, which I also found pretty fascinating. And she does tell you like what she made up, what timeline she altered to fit her story, mm -hmm. and the fact that she was really focusing on Jesus's humanity more than his, you know, although John the Baptist and all that and his venturing off into, um, you know, his public life is, is all in there. So interesting, very interesting book more humanity than his deity. Correct. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I, I've only read one other Sue Monk Kid, which was um, The Invention of Wings, which I didn't love. But that one sounds really Oh, I read that too. I read that one. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It was better yeah. than Mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read that. Yes, it was better than the mermaid chair with the dog people. Oh, I shouldn't really say that, but that's no, just it, how it, I felt. It, it was not one of her best, I didn't think. No. <laughs> I, I think a contract was in order and a deadline of a pressure, you know, loomed. So, so I'm going to skip that one and maybe pick this one up, it sounds <laughs> like. <laughs> um, okay, so my last book is um, called Unfamiliar Fishes by Sarah Vowell. So it's a nonfiction book about the history of Hawaii and specifically about um, the history of colonization of Hawaii. So it starts with the first missionaries um, landing on Hawaiian shores and um, goes through the 1700s, 1800s, the establishment of um, plantations on Hawaii for sugarcane and pineapple. Um, talks a lot about the Dole Empire um, and how sort of Hawaiians lost control of their own land. Um, so it sounds like very heavy subject matter in places, and sometimes it is. Um, but Sarah Vowell is hysterical. She's written a bunch of nonfiction books. Um, she has a couple of memoirs, um, like Assassination Vacation, um, 
there's another one that the title I'm blanking on, but she's also written a couple of other histories. Um, the Wordy Shipmates, which is about um, the Pilgrims, um, Lafayette and the somewhat United States. <laughs> um, and she has a really sort of um, wry take on history. Um, so there's a lot of very funny moments, even through the heavy subject matter. Um, she's also got a very unique um, voice, like physically her, her voice. Um, so if you get one of her books on audio that she narrates, it's a very, it's a unique experience. Um, she's also a contributor a lot to This American Life, if you listen to that show. Um, and she's done some other voice work, but um, Unfamiliar Fishes. So the, the central sort of idea is this quote that she found in, I want to say it was like a biology book about how it's essentially about invasive species, like unfamiliar fishes will enter the waters and then sort of take over and disrupt the ecosystem. And that's sort of the central premise of um, Western colonization of Hawaii that, um, that Westerners are essentially an invasive species in Hawaii. Um, so she talks a lot about um, the way Hawaiian culture operated before colonization and then sort of that whole process of colonization. And it's really interesting and there's a lot of history there that affects, um, you know, mainland US that we are, most of us probably not aware of. I know I was not aware of a lot of the stuff that she was talking about. Um, so again, heavy subject matter, but um, treated in a very sort of light and humorous way. Um, without taking away from the gravity of it, you know, so she's not like making jokes about colonization, but at the same time, like she's got sort of that wry look at things um, that lightens the mood. Um, so I would recommend any of Sarah Val's nonfiction, um, but particularly in this case, Unfamiliar Fishes, which I thought was a nice companion read to Sharks in the Time of Saviors. How do you spell her last name? Uh, V-O-W-E-L-L, -L, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Ms. Cheryl. It was really you fun are welcome. talking about adult books. I know. It's a new <laughs> thing for me. <laughs> um, and we will see you all. Um, let's see. Not next week. Um, in June, we're moving to two book breaks a month as opposed to every week now that we are back in the building. Um, so we will see you in a couple of weeks and you can always find the schedule for book break on our online events calendar. Um, so thank you, Cheryl and Claire, and thank you everybody for tuning in and we will see you in June. Bye. 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 -bye.